Hello, STAT 200. Welcome to the full video lecture for Lesson 12. In this lesson, we'll be learning more about correlation and simple linear regression. We introduced both of these topics in Lesson 3. A lot of the content in this lesson is a review. In terms of new content, this week we'll learn how to test for the statistical significance of a correlation or for the slope in a simple linear regression model using the t-distribution. These are the learning objectives for this lesson. If you're watching this video in YouTube, in the video description you can find timestamps to jump around to the different learning objectives if there is one thing in particular that you want to review. Parts of many of these objectives were first introduced in Lesson 3, but we'll review them all again here. What's new in Lesson 12 is how we'll be testing for the statistical significance of a correlation and simple linear regression slope. We'll be using a t-distribution as opposed to the bootstrapping and randomization procedures that you learned in earlier lessons. Objectives 7, 8, and 9 are also new. These dig into the applications of correlation and regression a bit deeper. Let's get started with the first learning objective. Construct a scatter plot using Minitab Express and interpret it. Scatter plots are used to display data from two quantitative variables. We have two axes. The horizontal axis is the x-axis, and the vertical axis is the y-axis. If you're using one variable to predict the other, then the explanatory variable would be on the x-axis, and the response variable would be on the y-axis. I'll take you to Minitab Express now to review how to make a scatter plot there. This is the serial data set from the LOC5 textbook. We have data from 30 different types of serial. What we're going to look at now is the relationship between the amount of sugar in a serving and the number of calories. Let's say that we eventually want to use amount of sugar to predict number of calories. I'm on a PC, but the directions are the same for this if you're on a Mac. Go to Graphs, Scatterplot, Simple. We want to use sugar to predict calories. I always feel like the X and Y here are opposite of how I usually say this. They ask for Y first, and this is the response variable or what's being predicted. In this case, number of calories. And then the Y variable which is the explanatory variable, in this case, sugars. When we look at a scatter plot, we can visually judge the direction, form, and strength of the relationship between the two variables, and we can determine if there are any outliers. Here, we have a positive linear relationship, because if I were to draw a line of best fit, it would be a straight line moving upward from bottom left to upper right. It's a moderately strong relationship because the points will be relatively close to the line. Again, this is just a rough visual judgment. Soon we'll review how to compute the correlation coefficient as a quantitative measure of the strength of this relationship. There are no obvious outliers. I'll take you back to the PowerPoint slides now to keep working through our learning objectives but we'll be back here later to compute Pearson's R correlation coefficient and to construct a simple linear regression model using these data. Our second learning objective is to identify the explanatory and response variables in a given scenario. The explanatory variable predicts or explains variation in the response variable. These are the definitions from the online notes. An explanatory variable is a variable that is used to explain variability in the response variable, also known as an independent variable or predictor variable. In an experimental study, this is the variable that is manipulated by the researcher. A response variable is the outcome variable, also known as the dependent variable. Let's look at a few examples. 
Can height be used to predict weight in American adults? Height is predicting weight, so height is the explanatory variable, and weight is the response variable. Can we predict final exam scores using midterm exam scores? Note that the wording here is opposite of the last question. Instead of saying, can we use X to predict Y? Now we're asking, can we predict Y using X? So we're predicting final exam scores. That's our response variable. Midterm exam scores are the explanatory variable. This is the last example. Is there a relationship between ratings of happiness and annual income? In this case, we're not using one variable to predict another. We don't have an explanatory or response variable when we're examining a relationship between two variables as opposed to using one to predict the other. We don't need to label the variables as explanatory and response in this case. This is a scenario where we would compute a correlation and recall in correlation, R of X and Y equals R of Y and X. In other words, the X and Y variables are interchangeable. This transitions nicely to our third learning objective. Identify situations in which correlation or regression analyses are appropriate. There are many different types of correlation and regression in this course, the only correlation that we're covering is Pearson's R, and the only type of regression that we're covering is simple linear regression. Both Pearson's R and simple linear regression are used with two quantitative variables. If we're given a scenario with two quantitative variables, we need to determine if we're looking for a relationship, in which case we would use Pearson's R, or if we're making a prediction, in which case we would use simple linear regression. With correlation, X and Y are interchangeable. The correlation between X and Y is the same as the correlation between Y and X. We do not need to have an explanatory and response variable. In simple linear regression, we do need to have a designated explanatory and response variable. X is always the explanatory variable and y is always the response variable. If we would flip x and y in regression, the y-intercept and slope would change, and we'd be addressing a different research question. Both Pearson's R and simple linear regression assume a linear relationship. There are other types of correlation and regression that can be used with nonlinear relationships, but everything that we do in this course assumes a linear relationship. Let's look at a few scenarios and talk through whether correlation or regression would be the appropriate method. Can the size of a school, in other words, enrollment, be used to predict how many basketball games they'll win? Size of the school measured by enrollment numbers is a quantitative variable. The number of basketball games won is also a quantitative variable. So we do have two quantitative variables. The next question is, are we looking for a relationship or do we want to make a prediction? The research question here is for a prediction. So we're going to be using simple linear regression. Here's another example. Can we use Wiley Plus scores to estimate students' final exam scores? Wiley Plus scores and final exam scores are both quantitative variables. In estimating, final exam scores using Wiley Plus scores, we would be making a prediction. Simple linear regression is the appropriate analysis here. And one last example. How strongly related are outdoor temperature and ice cream sales? Outdoor temperature and ice cream sales can both be measured as quantitative variables. Next, we ask if we're examining a relationship or trying to make a prediction. We want to estimate the strength of a relationship. Correlation is the appropriate analysis here. 
Our fourth learning objective is to compute Pearson's R using Minitab Express, interpret it, and test for its statistical significance. We'll review the interpretation of Pearson's R first, then I'll take you to Minitab Express to show you how to compute it there. We have five properties of Pearson's R to review. First, Pearson's R must be between negative one and positive one. It is not mathematically possible for R to be outside of this range. Second, for a positive association, R is greater than zero. For a negative association, R is less than zero. For no association, R equals zero. In other words, the sign of R, whether it's positive or negative, gives us information about the direction of the relationship. Third, the closer to zero, the weaker the relationship. The closer to negative one or positive one, the stronger the relationship. In other words, the numerical value of R gives us information about the strength of the relationship. Fourth, correlation is unit free. This means that two variables do not need to be on the same scale and that two correlations can be compared even if the variables are all on different scales. For example, we can compute the correlation between height in inches and weight in pounds and compare that correlation from a different study that examined height in centimeters and weight in grams. And fifth, it does not matter which variable you label as X and which you label as Y. We saw this twice already. The correlation between X and Y is the same as the correlation between Y and X. These are the general guidelines that we use when describing the strength of a relationship given Pearson's R. The absolute value of Pearson's R means that we just look at the numeric value. The numeric value is what gives us information about the strength of the relationship. The sign, so whether it's positive or negative, gives us information about the direction of the relationship. Let's just look at one example. Order the following correlations from weakest to strongest. R equals negative 0.88, R equals positive 0.25 and R equals positive 0.78. This is a question that is frequently missed on the quizzes. Here we're looking at the strength of the relationship, which is just the numeric value. We're not concerned with the direction of the relationship. The weakest correlation will be the one with the smallest absolute value. In other words, ignoring the sign the smallest number. The weakest correlation here is R equals 0 0.25. Next, R equals 0 0.78. And then the strongest will be the correlation with the largest absolute value. Here, R equals negative 0 0.88. The last thing that I want to show you before moving on to Minitab Express are some formulas. You will not need to do any of these calculations on the lab assignment, quiz, or exams, but there may be some Wiley Plus questions since these formulas are in the textbook. There are a few different ways to present the formula for Pearson's R. This is my preferred formula because it shows the relationship between z-scores and Pearson's R. You could rearrange this and substitute the z-score formulas in there to get the version presented in chapter two of your textbook. These are actually the same formulas. The formula from the textbook just pulls out the n minus one and replaces the z's with the z-score equations. Once you have r, this can be converted to a t-test statistic. The p-value for r is based on the t-distribution. The t-test statistic is always equal to the sample statistic minus the null parameter divided by the standard error. Our sample statistic is Pearson's R. Usually we want to know if there's evidence of some relationship, so the null is that there's no relationship or R equals zero. Since this is usually zero, it's sometimes left off of this formula and you might see the numerator as just R. In the denominator here, we have the standard error. 
With a bit of algebra, your textbook arranges the formula like this, probably because it makes the hand calculations easier. The T distribution varies depending on degrees of freedom. For Pearson's R, the degrees of freedom are equal to the sample size minus 2. Now that we know how to interpret Pearson's R and we know the basic formulas, let's go to Minitab Express to review how to compute it there. I still have the serial data set from the Log5 textbook open. I want to compute the correlation between the amount of sugar in a cereal and the number of calories. We've already constructed a scatter plot of these data, so we know that the relationship is linear. I'm on a PC, so I'll go to Statistics, Correlation, Correlation. If you're on a Mac, the steps will be Statistics, Regression, Correlation. I'll select Calories and Sugars. If you do select more than two, Minitab Express will give you a correlation matrix with the correlations and p-values for each of these possible pairs. If we select just two variables, this is what our Pearson's R output looks like. In this case, Pearson's R equals 0 0.660110. This is a moderately strong positive correlation. Minitab Express also gives you the p-value for this correlation. For correlation and regression, Minitab Express will always conduct a two-tailed test. Let's go back to the PowerPoint slides now to walk through the five-step hypothesis testing procedure using this output. Step one is to check assumptions and write hypotheses. Both variables are quantitative, and we constructed a scatter plot to show that the relationship is linear, so all assumptions have been met. To write our hypotheses, we weren't given any prior information to determine if the relationship should be positive or negative, so we conduct a two-tailed test. By default, Minitab Express is also conducting a two-tailed test. The null is that rho, or the correlation in the population, equals zero. The alternative is that rho does not equal zero. Step two is to find the test statistic. We used Minitab Express to compute the correlation. Here, R equals 0 0.660110. This is our test statistic. The sampling distribution will be approximated by a T distribution to find the P value, but Minitab Express and most other statistical software will only give you the value of Pearson's R because R is already on a standardized scale of negative one to positive one, so it often isn't converted to a t-test statistic. So when you're doing the five steps for Pearson's R, in step two, what you should list is the Pearson's R correlation coefficient. Step three is to find the p-value. From our output, p is less than 0.0001, Step four is to make a decision. P is less than the standard alpha level of 0.05, so we reject the null hypothesis. And in step five, we state our conclusion. There is evidence of a relationship between the amount of sugar in cereal and the number of calories. Conducting a hypothesis test for a correlation is quite quick and straightforward if you have statistical software like Minitab Express. As I said earlier, when you're using Minitab Express to compute a correlation, you can enter in more than two variables. When you do that, you'll be given a correlation matrix, which looks completely different from the output that we have here with just two variables. Let's go back to Minitab Express to see what a correlation matrix looks like and to practice reading one. This is still the serial data set from the Log5 textbook. To construct a correlation matrix, we'll go through the same procedure, but this time select more than two variables. I'm on a PC, so this is statistics, correlation, correlation. If you're on a Mac, it will be statistics, regression, correlation. This time I'm going to select four variables. Calories, fat, 
carbs, and sugars. Our output looks different now. With four variables, there are six different pairs. For each pair of variables, Minitab Express is computing Pearson's R and a p-value. Minitab Express is not adjusting these p-values to take into account that six tests are being conducted simultaneously, so you should be careful if you have a large correlation matrix to consider the possibility of a type 1 error occurring because you're running so many tests. To read this, we would find the row and the column that matches up to the two variables that we're interested in. Let's find calories and sugars again. This would be the cell where calories and sugars intersect. We have calories in the first column and sugars in the bottom row. We can see that we have the same correlation and p-value that we found earlier when we looked at these two variables. Pearson's R is 0 0.660110 with a p-value that is less than 0 0.0001. If we wanted to know which variables had the strongest relationship, we would look for the correlation with the largest absolute value. Here, the largest value is in this cell. This is calories and carbs. This is a good time to take a break to review the first four learning objectives. In the fifth learning objective, we're going to shift from correlation to simple linear regression. Our fifth learning objective is to construct a simple linear regression model, in other words, compute the y-intercept and slope, using Minitab Express, interpret it, and test for its statistical significance. Again, we'll start with the review and then go back to Minitab Express to run through an example. The general form of a simple linear regression model for a sample could be written a few different ways. Earlier in your textbook, they used the notation y hat equals a plus bx, where y hat was the predicted value of y, a is the y-intercept, this is where the regression line crosses the y-axis. B was the slope. And X was the observed X value. From here on out, you're going to see slightly different notation. That is Y hat equals B sub O plus B sub 1 x, where b sub o is the y-intercept and b sub 1 is the slope. In a population, we use Greek symbols to represent the y-intercept and slope. What you'll see most often is y equals beta sub o, which is the y-intercept for the population, plus beta sub 1 x where beta sub 1 is the slope in the population. In the population, we often add plus epsilon. Epsilon is the residual. We saw this earlier in lesson 3. In a sample, this is written as a lowercase e, and it's equal to y minus y hat. In other words, the observed value of y minus the value of y predicted using your regression model. Minitab Express and most statistical softwares compute the y-intercept and slope so that the sum of the squared residuals is as small as possible. In other words, it wants the sum of all of the residuals squared to be as small as mathematically possible. This is known as the least squares method. Let's go to Minitab Express now to walk through an example of obtaining a simple linear regression model and interpreting its slope and y-intercept. Then I'll bring you back here to go over some assumptions that we always need to check 
before testing for the statistical significance of the simple linear regression slope with the t distribution. I still have the serial data set from the LOC5 textbook up. Let's construct a simple linear regression model using sugars to predict calories. I'm on a PC, but the steps are the same on a Mac. Go to Statistics, Regression, Simple Regression. We want to predict calories. That's our response or y variable. Our predictor or x variable is sugars. In this course, we'll only be doing simple linear regression. We'll always be using the default linear setting. Quadratic and cubic are different nonlinear patterns that the relationship between x and y could take. Under options, I usually don't select either of these. They would draw different intervals around the line of best fit on the scatter plot. Under graphs, check the box for residual plots. We'll need these later to check assumptions before using the t-distribution to test for the statistical significance of the slope. Minitab Express give you a lot of output here. We'll start with the regression equation. We can get the y-intercept and slope from the coefficients table. The constant is the y-intercept and the slope is the coefficient that goes with sugars. Or Minitab Express also writes out the regression equation right below this table. Our y-intercept is 88.92. This is where the line of best fit will cross the y-axis. Our slope is 4.3103. For every one unit increase in sugars, the predicted number of calories increases by 4.3103. If we scroll down, we're given a scatter plot with the line of best fit. After the scatter plot with the line of best fit, we have a plot of residuals versus fits. We won't be using the versus orders table, but we will be using the normal probability plot, and we will be using the histogram of residuals. We'll see these when we go back to the PowerPoint slides now to check assumptions. These are the four assumptions that must be met in order to approximate the sampling distribution for the slope with the T distribution. I usually use the acronym LINE. L stands for linearity. The relationship between X and Y must be linear. We check this by looking at a scatter plot of the x and y variables. The line of best fit must be a straight line. The I stands for independence of errors. The errors are the residuals. Recall that a residual is the difference between an observed y value and a predicted y value. In a sample, E equals y minus y hat where E is the residual, Y is the observed Y value, and Y hat is the predicted Y value. There should not be a relationship between the residuals and the fitted values. The fitted values are the predicted Y hat values, which are directly correlated with the X values. We check this by examining the scatter plot of residuals versus fits. When you ask for the residual plots in Minitab Express, it will give you this plot, and in a minute we'll look at an example. What we want to see in this plot is no relationship. The N stands for normality of errors. This means that the residuals should be approximately normally distributed. We're working with sample data, so these plots won't be perfectly normal. There are two options for checking this assumption. 
The first option is the normal probability plot, which Minitab Express will also give you with the residual plots. The dots on that plot should lie close to the line. The second option is to use the histogram of residuals, which should resemble a normal distribution. The last assumption, or the E in the line acronym, is equal error variances. Again, the errors are the residuals. The variance of the residuals should be constant over all of the fitted values. We'll look at the plot of residuals versus fits again, but this time we're looking at the spread of the residuals. The spread of the residuals should be the same as we move from left to right. If the plot shows a pattern, for example, a bow tie or a megaphone shape, then variances are not consistent and this assumption has not been met. Let's look at an example of checking each of these assumptions using the residual plots that we just got from Minitab Express when we obtained the output for the simple linear regression model using sugars to predict calories. We'll start by checking for linearity. I'll pull up the scatter plot of X and Y, which in this case are sugars and calories. Here's the scatter plot with sugars on the x-axis and calories on the y-axis. The line on this plot will always be a straight line because we asked for a simple linear regression model. So ignore the line and just look at the dots. Or you can make a scatter plot like we did earlier by going to graphs and scatter plot and that won't have the line of best fit drawn on it. The line of best fit for these dots should be a straight line. I like to draw an outline of all of the dots to get an idea of what the shape is. In this case, we can see that the relationship between sugars and calories is linear, so this assumption is met. The second assumption is independence of errors. We look at the plot of the residuals versus fits and want to see that there is not a relationship between the residuals and the fitted values. If I draw a bubble around most of the points, we can see that the pattern should be horizontal. The line of best fit should be a flat horizontal line. The third assumption is normality of errors. The residuals should be approximately normally distributed. There are two different plots that Minitab Express produces when you ask for the residual plots. First is the normal probability plot. The points on this plot should all be close to the red line. If the distribution were perfectly normal, they would all be on the line. We don't see any points traveling too far off of this line, so this distribution is good and this assumption has been met. We could have also looked at the histogram of residuals. Again, these are sample data, so it's not going to be perfectly normal. We just don't want to see any major skewness or outliers here. For large samples, I like the histogram. But for smaller samples, such as this one, I tend to prefer the normal probability plot. The last assumption is equal error variances. The variance of the residuals should be constant over all fitted values. When we look at the plot of residuals versus fits again, this time we're looking at the spread of the residuals. As we move from left to right, the variability should be approximately constant. If all four of these assumptions are met, then we can use the T distribution to approximate the sampling distribution when we conduct a hypothesis test for a slope. We'll move on now to using the five-step hypothesis testing procedure to test for the statistical significance of the slope. The five-step hypothesis testing procedure for a slope is very similar to the one that we've used in the last few lessons. Step one is to check assumptions and write hypotheses. We just walked through the four assumptions using the acronym LINE. For the lab assignment, it's very important that you include the plots that you used and a brief description of what you looked for in each. The null hypothesis is that beta sub 1 equals 0, 
which is the slope in the population. This means that the line of best fit in the population is a flat horizontal line. In other words, x cannot be used to predict y. The alternative hypothesis that Minitab Express tests is that beta sub 1 does not equal 0. Minitab Express and a lot of statistical software will only do a two-tailed test for correlation and regression. But we know that the t distribution is symmetrical, so the p-value for a one-tailed test would be half of what it is for a two-tailed test, as long as our alternative hypothesis is going in the correct direction. Step two is to identify the test statistic. Minitab Express will compute the t-test statistic. It can be found on the coefficients table in the bottom row with the value of the slope. These are the formulas that are used. As always, the test statistic is the difference between the observed sample statistic, in this case b sub 1, which is the sample slope. We could write a minus 0 here because the null parameter is that the population slope is 0. Often this is left off though. This is divided by the standard error of the slope. The formula for the standard error is a bit rough because you would need to compute all of the residuals and deviations. I don't think any of the Wiley Plus questions will ask for this, but if they do, just use Minitab Express. Step three is to identify the p-value. Construct a t-distribution where the degrees of freedom are equal to the sample size minus two. The process of finding the area under that distribution that is more extreme than the observed sample statistic is the same as what we did with one and two sample means. The p-value in the Minitab Express output will always be the two-tailed p-value. If you have a one-tailed test, then you'll need to divide the given p-value in half and double check that the direction of your alternative hypothesis is consistent with your sample data. Step four is to make a decision. As always, if the p-value is less than or equal to the alpha level, typically 0.05, reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is greater than the alpha level, fail to reject the null hypothesis. And step five, state a real world conclusion. If the null hypothesis is rejected, then x can be used to predict y in the population. When you write this out, be sure to replace x and y with the actual variables that you're working with. If the null hypothesis is not rejected, then x cannot be used to predict y in the population. Let's walk through one example using the coefficients table from when we used sugars to predict calories. Here's the output from Minitab Express. The constant is actually the y-intercept, or b sub o. This is the value of the y-intercept in our sample. We typically don't want to test the statistical significance of the y-intercept. It's unusual, at least at an introductory level, to have a research question related to the value of the y-intercept. So we won't be using these values at all as we're walking through this five-step hypothesis testing procedure. The bottom row is labeled sugars here because sugars is our explanatory variable. Recall that the slope is the value that's attached to the explanatory variable. The values in the bottom row are the ones that we'll be working with. The coefficient is the slope, which we call b sub 1. And the standard error of the coefficient is the standard error of b sub 1 that we saw earlier. This is the t test statistic that we'll be using and the p value. Step one is to check assumptions and write hypotheses. We already went through an example of checking the four assumptions and they were all met. The null hypothesis is that the slope in the population equals zero. The alternative is that the slope in the population is different from zero. 
Step two is to identify the test statistic. We're given the slope, which will be in the bottom row, and our test statistic is a t-test statistic. Here, 4.65. Step three is to identify the p-value. We can also get this from our coefficients table. p is less than 0 0.0001. Because our p-value is less than the standard alpha level of 0.05, in step four, we reject the null hypothesis. In step five, state a real-world conclusion. Sugars can be used to predict calories in the population of all cereals. For simple linear regression, checking the assumptions is what takes the most time. Once you get the output from Minitab Express, you should be able to run through steps two through five fairly quickly. In addition to hypothesis testing, you can also construct confidence intervals for the slope. I'll show you one quick example of this, but it's not one of the primary learning objectives for this lesson. We can apply the same general form of a confidence interval that we've been using since lesson four. The sample statistic is the slope, B sub one, plus or minus the multiplier, here that's a t multiplier where the degrees of freedom are equal to the sample size minus two times the standard error. Here the standard error of the sample slope. The slope and the standard error we can get from the mini tab express output. Here's the slope and the standard error of the slope. The t multiplier we can find by making a t distribution in Minitab Express or stat key. I'll take you to Minitab Express now. We're going to construct a t distribution with degrees of freedom equal to the sample size minus 2. Sample size here was 30. So 28 degrees of freedom to find the t multipliers that separate the middle 95% from the outer 5%. I'll construct a probability distribution plot to display the probability. We have a t distribution with 28 degrees of freedom and we want to find the t-values that separate the middle 95% from the outer 5%. So we have 5% split equally between the two tails. Our t-multiplier is 2.04841. The 95% confidence interval for the slope will be 4.3103 plus and minus 2.04841, which we just found in Minitab Express, times the standard error of 0 0.9269. This gives us 4.3103 plus and minus the margin of error which is equal to 1.8987. We have a lower bound of 2.4116 and an upper bound of 6.2090. To interpret this confidence interval, I would say that I am 95% confident that the slope in the population for this model using sugars to predict calories in cereal would be between 2.4116 and 6.2090. That is everything that we're going to cover for learning objective five. It took a while because we had to check all of those assumptions, which were new this week, 
but the rest of the hypothesis testing procedure and confidence intervals should look familiar because they follow the same general forms that we've used for means and proportions. The sixth learning objective is to compute and interpret a residual given a simple linear regression model. We saw residuals earlier in this lesson and also back in lesson three. In a sample, we use the letter E. This stands for error. It's equal to Y minus Y hat, where Y is the observed value and Y hat is the predicted value. Mathematically, what this is doing is calculating the distance between the observed value, which on the scatter plot is the dot, and the regression line. As an example, this point has one of the largest residuals here because it's the furthest from the regression line. To find the residual, we drop a vertical line from the point down to the regression line. The observed y value for this point, if we go over, is about 215. So the residual is going to be 215 minus the value that was predicted using the regression equation, which is around 160. This equals 55. In other words, the distance here from the point down to the regression line is approximately equal to 55. To interpret this, we would say that this particular cereal has 55 more calories than predicted given its sugar content. Our seventh learning objective is to compute and interpret the coefficient of determination known as R squared. This is a measure of effect size that can be used with correlation or regression. R squared is the proportion of variation in the response variable that can be explained by or accounted for by the explanatory variable. I've also heard this described as the proportion of shared variance. Because R squared is a proportion, it must always be between zero and positive one. To calculate R squared for a correlation, you literally take Pearson's R and you square it. Here's a quick example. Earlier we found the correlation between sugars and calories was 0.660110. R squared, or the coefficient of determination for this relationship, would then be 0.660110 squared. This equals 0.4357. To interpret this, about 43.57% of the variation cereals calories can be attributed to variations in sugars. In simple linear regression, Minitab Express will give you R squared in the model summary. Here's the model summary for the regression model that we ran earlier using sugars to predict calories. You want to use the first R squared value, not the second one, which is adjusted. Note that this R squared value from the regression model is the same as it was when we computed it using the Pearson's R correlation coefficient. Our eighth learning objective is to explain how outliers can influence correlation and regression analyses. Looking at these scatter plots, the bivariate outliers are the points that don't fit with the general form of the other points or that are outside of the general range of the other points. In the first plot of height and weight, this outlier is probably a typo or someone who didn't read the directions to enter their height in inches. In the second plot of Wiley Plus grades and midterm exam scores, these outliers are probably students who didn't take the midterm exam and therefore scored a zero on it. Next, I'll show you how these outliers impact the correlation and regression models. Here's the Wiley Plus and midterm exam scatter plot again. On the left, the outliers were left in. On the right, 
the outliers were deleted. The y-intercept and the slope both changed when the outliers were taken out. Without the outliers, the slope is smaller, so the line is a bit flatter. The correlation also changed. When the outliers were removed, the correlation decreased in this case. I'll show you one more example. In this case, the outlier was located above the rest of the points. Here, when the outlier was removed, the regression line got steeper, as seen by the increase in the slope. The correlation also increased when the outlier was removed. From these two examples, we can see that depending on where the outliers are located, they can make the slope and correlation stronger or weaker. Our last learning objective is to explain why extrapolation is inappropriate. We briefly mentioned this in lesson three. Here's the dictionary definition of extrapolation. The action of estimating or concluding something by assuming that existing trends will continue or a current method will remain applicable. In regression, this is something that we try to avoid doing. It is inappropriate to use a regression model to make an estimate beyond the range of the data that were used to build that model. For example, we should not use this model to estimate the calories that would be in a cereal with 30 grams of sugar, because that is outside of the range of our sample data. We don't know if there's a linear trend that will continue beyond 20 grams of sugar. We also shouldn't try to apply a regression model that was built with data drawn from one population to a case from a different population. For example, if I use data from world campus students to study the relationship between Wiley Plus scores and exam scores, I shouldn't try to apply that same model to University Park students because those are two different populations and the relations may be different in those different groups. This concludes the Lesson 12 full video lecture. There were a lot of learning objectives covered here. If you're watching this video on YouTube, in the video description you can find some timestamps to jump around to the different learning objectives if there's just one thing in particular that you want to go back to review. As always, if you have any questions, please post them to the Lesson 12 discussion board in Canvas.